Okay, folks, I, I think we'll begin. There may be a few uh, late arrivals, but um, I know lunch comes after a while, and so we uh, have to keep our priorities straight here. So uh, today, uh, we're very lucky to have uh, Professor Suzanne McDonough of uh, the University of Ulster, Professor of Health and Rehabilitation, to talk about uh, attitudes and experience of complementary medicine. This is the data based upon the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey, one of the modules from the most recent survey. So the, the, the format will be that, um, for those of you that haven't been here before, is, uh, Suzanne will talk probably for about a half an hour, a little bit longer. And then we uh, uh, have to take uh, questions and comments from the audience and so have a, a bit of a discussion. It should take us up to the hour. So without further ado, I'll yeah. turn over to Suzanne. Thank you very much. Now, it gives me great pleasure to be here this afternoon to talk to you about these findings, which are the first findings for Northern Ireland previous to the survey. We didn't actually have any data on complementary and alternative medicine use. And I'm going to shorten that to CAM the whole way through my talk, just to save it's a bit of a mouthful otherwise. Um, so this survey was done in collaboration with the Life and Times uh, survey, and um, Dave Astor and I have been thinking about doing this for about six years now, but we never had the money to do it, essentially. And then we're very lucky to get some money from the Department of Education and Learning through their Strategic Priority Fund. And that's what the money that we use to actually fund this piece of work. Um, and I'd just like to thank my collaborators on this. Um, obviously Dave was in Ulster when we first conceived this. Um, and we worked very closely with um, Liz, um, who's he and his aunt is here in the audience with us, in terms of uh, developing the questionnaire. And then Paula Devine has contributed to the um, analysis of the data. So just to give you a little bit of information about the Life and Time survey, some of you may already be very familiar with this, but this is an annual survey since 1998. It monitors the attitudes and behaviours of people in Northern Ireland, and um, in that way it allows us to have a time series or public record of attitudes and behaviour. Now obviously this is the first time that we've had a major module on complementary and alternative medicine, and obviously I'd be very hopeful that we could repeat this in the future. And I know I've got some colleagues here from the Department of Health, which may be clean now, that they're the Department of Health is funding a long survey of health. Um, and I think that given uh, some of the developments in Northern Ireland at the moment, I think it would be very important that we would be able to repeat this to, to look at change behaviours over time. And it's descended from the Northern Ireland Social Attitude Survey, which started in 1989, and it's a modular format. So in 2005, there were six um, different modules, and obviously the one that I'm presenting today is the use of an attitude to complement and alternative therapies. Um, and, and, and some of you may have been familiar with some of the other models which have got quite a lot of press in the last month or so. So why are we interested in CAM therapies? I think there was quite a high given to um, complementary and alternative medicines when the House of Lords report was published in 2000. And this is an extremely comprehensive report which is essentially looking at what CAM therapies were available and being used in the UK and then grouping them into three main groupings. And some of the factors that they took into consideration were the levels of regulation of some of these therapies, the uh, scientific evidence underpinning some of these therapies, and they spent quite a lot of time actually talking to both conventional medicine practitioners and alternative medicine practitioners to really get a good handle on this uh, topic. The uh, group one therapies were the therapies that, um, based on consensus, are uh, those therapies that are considered to be well regulated in the UK and have some evidence of effectiveness for certain conditions and also tend to have um, their own particular diagnosis um, uh, or framework around their diagnosis and subsequent management. And, the, and these are called the sort of big five therapies and certainly the House of Lords was, was recommending that these big five therapies should be available through the NHS and they are acupuncture, chiropractic, homeopathy, osteopathy and herbal medicine. They obviously also talked about group th two therapies, and I'm just going to highlight some of these, so things like uh, aromatherapy and reflexology, because these are being used in the NHS, particularly for um, palliative care. So they were acknowledging that um, some therapies are already integrated within the NHS. And so we were sort of looking at this and taking this into consideration when we were thinking about the survey and then you know, our subsequent analysis of the results. So why might we want to integrate CAM into the NHS? And I think this is really important um, and a very good question to ask. And there is evidence that if you integrate CAM therapies with conventional medicine, it's actually more cost effective. And certainly it's um, 
patient satisfaction is very high with these camp therapies, and you'll see that from the results of our survey. So one of the ways in which CAM can reduce costs is that, that it may reduce the requirement for expensive prescription drugs or the requirement for surgery. And that's obviously going to cost, uh, it's going to save money for the NHS. And we all know that the NHS, there are scarce resources with the NHS, particularly when we're talking about drugs. Again, we hear about that a lot in the media. Other important aspects then of integration are uh, the role that GPs or other health professionals play in referral. And certainly, uh, other studies in the UK would suggest that GPs do want to refer their patients for camp therapies, but they're not always available or easily available for them. Um, and I think then also camp therapists in themselves, so those people who are um, privately accessed, so people who would self refer to camp therapies, these therapists also play a role in trying to produce integration because they really should be encouraging their patients to tell their GP that they're attending. And we'll see from the results that that's really not happening. I'm not saying that that's therapy is not encouraging people, but there seems to be a reluctance amongst the public to tell a GP that they're using health therapies. So I'm just going to, just as a little bit of background before we go into our results, look at some of the prevalence figures from other countries. Now these, this is a paper that was published in 2005 comparing CAM use in the states over a 10 year period. And you can see here that if you're looking at the use of CAM in the past 12 months, that the prevalence rate hasn't changed hugely. Um, so it's remaining quite stable, but it's certainly much higher than the reported figures um, that we have for the UK. Um, but you can see that individual therapies have changed quite a lot. So I've just highlighted herbal medicine. So in 1990, 2.5% uh, of people were using herbal medicine. And that had shot up to 18.6% in 2002. And I think this is a particularly interesting one because urban medicines may not always be prescribed by a practitioner. People may get it over the counter. And there may be difficulties in the quality of the herbal medicines that they're using. And also, if they're not then telling the physician that they're using these therapies, there may be interactions with other drugs that they're using. And this ultimately, if we saw something similar happening in the UK, this ultimately is going to cost the NHS more money. Uh, because it's going to lead to problems and uh, side effects that uh, the GP may not be aware of. If we then look at um, GP <coughs> prevalence figures, and remembering of course that we don't have any figures for Northern Ireland until this survey was done. This is England, Scotland and Wales. And the use of CAM in the past 12 months, and this is a paper published in 2004, but it's data from 2001. The figure was 10%. So a third of the prevalence rates that we're seeing from the states um, and if we look at the individual use of some of these therapies, it's between 1 and 2%. So it seems to be quite low, and certainly uh, it would suggest that people in, in GP are using less CAM therapies than, for example, in the States. So the rationale then for our survey was because we have no data for Northern Ireland, and because the House of the Lords report was suggesting that we needed more quantitative information, really to inform public and healthcare policy, that we decided we should go ahead and do the survey. Now obviously as researchers within the University of Ulster with a particular interest in CAM and in my case in particular acupuncture, this was going to be a useful database for me then to um, design future research studies or identify really important questions to ask with respect to CAM therapies. And I was particularly interested in, excuse me, not only in the levels of use but also in the amount of integration. So how much integration do we actually have in Northern Ireland between CAM therapies and conventional medicine? So here are the questions that we asked then. We asked about the percentage of CAM use and who uh, was using it, so what kinds of people were using it, were there any differences. We asked them which therapies they were using, now, there were a, a, a very wide range of therapies, so 24 therapies that we asked, specifically asked them about, but we also asked them about over the counter remedies, so everything from copper bracelets to lavender to cod liver oil, so we have a huge amount of information. Now obviously today I'm only presenting the main findings from the survey because there's just far too much to, uh, to present and for some of the therapies a very small percentage of use. We were also interested in who they consulted and how they managed to get to these people. So were they going to their GP or health professional or how were they getting information about these therapists? What were their reasons for using CAM and trying to get some handle on whether they were using it because they weren't satisfied with conventional medicine? Um, and what they actually thought, did they think they worked? And the other important thing was we wanted to find out about adverse reactions. Now there have been certainly uh, big surveys looking at adverse reactions, certainly for acupuncture in the UK, but that was at the level of the practitioner, 
rather than gen the general public. And you may get a very di different answer when you ask the general public about adverse reactions. So this is just a little bit about the methods that was used. And again, this is the method that's used in the lifetime survey. So they sampled postal addresses um, so that it was a, a representative sample of the whole of the Northern Irish population. And then they stratified um, a random sample of households and then they interviewed one adult over the age of 18 from each household. And you can see the 1,200 responses and 61% response rate, which for a survey is actually excellent response rate. And this was completed by um, trained interviewers who completed on laptops, so it was a computer assisted completion. So, just then to have a look at some of our findings. So you can see here in this um, graph here, this is the percentage use. So we ask them the percentage use ever. So have they ever used some form of camp therapy? And 47% of people had used some form of camp. Now of this 47%, 55 have used more than one camp, and over a third had used more than two camps. So we get getting this pattern of people using multiple types of camp therapies. If we then look at the figures for over the previous year, we can see that it obviously drops to 29%, which is what you'd expect, but it's still a very high figure. And I've just the dashed line is just representing the 10% uh, figure from the GB survey, this is the Thomas and Coleman survey. So you can see there's been a massive increase in the amount of CAM being used. Now you could interpret this in two ways. One, you could say that people in Northern Ireland for some reason use a lot more CAM than in other parts of the UK. But I don't think that that's probably the reason. I think what we're seeing is the Thomas surveys carried up 2001, so it's about six years out of date. I think if we look at more recent figures in the GB, uh, we would find it probably has increased as well. And these figures are very similar to the figures that we're seeing from states and other parts of the world. So it's not too surprising that the prevalence rates have actually gone up. If we then look who's most likely to use CAP, and again, this has been done in other study, er, sorry, in other countries, and they've shown similar patterns. So if you look here at the sort of gender, you find that females tend to use CAM more than males. Um, and that's been shown in lots of other countries. And females are also better at filling out, filling out surveys. So you can get a small bias in terms of they're more likely to respond. But I think in all, we can say that females are much more likely to use it. The other thing we looked at then was age range. And you can see here again that if you were aged between 35 and 55, you were much more likely to use CAM therapies and the younger and the older age group are less likely. And now we haven't done an in-depth analysis of this, but one fact that might explain this is salary, because certainly the higher your salary, the more likely you are to use CAM. So perhaps younger and older have less um, income to spend on CAM therapies. We are interested in socioeconomic indicators for CAM use, and we did this in three ways. We asked them about the length of time they had remained in full-time education, their salary, and also then we looked at their um, their working status. Now we did just, I mean, Paula did a very, very detailed analysis of this, but we ended up dividing it into manual versus uh, non-manual working. And what we showed was that if you stayed in education for longer, Yes, if you stayed in education for longer, you were more likely to use CAM. So that would suggest that the more education, the more educated you are, the more likely you to explore the use of CAM. Also, if you look here then at the figures for um, salary, you can see very clearly that there is an increasing trend. So the more that you earn, the more that you're likely to use CAM therapies. And certainly there did seem to be some difference between people who were working in non-manual jobs using CAM more than people who were working in manual jobs. But I think it's worth pointing out that even people who are earning less than 10k, over 30, they're still using over 30% of CAM. I think that's important. And we'll see later on these, the majority of people are paying for these CAM therapies at the moment. Now here's the data for the top seven therapies used. So again, this is percentages here along the y-axis, percentage use. And the blue bars is the question, have you ever used some form of CAM? And the red bar is have you used some form of CAM in the previous year. Now, if we just take the blue bars first, we can see that the top three therapies are aromatherapy, reflexology, and massage therapy. And I'm just going to remind you about the, the group one therapies that the House of Lords are recommending to be part of the NHS. Don't include any of these therapies. The next three down we see are acupuncture, chiropractic, and herbal medicines. Sorry. 
and these are part of group one therapies, which are the ones that are considered to be better regulated and there might be more evidence of effectiveness. So obviously the general public is not necessarily reading the science underpinning CAMS, but they're making a choice, they're saying uh, these are the ones that were more effective. <coughs> and if you look then at, um, in, in the previous year, although there's some slight differences, the trend is much the same. You still have aromatherapy, reflexology, and massage therapy being the most popular forms of CAM therapy. Now, not all CAMs in our survey were given by practitioners, so they could have either been self uh, applied treatments or given by practitioner. So, when we looked at the data, so the top six given by the practitioner, it didn't change hugely, but reflexology became the most popular form of CAM. And obviously, aromatherapy in the previous slide had been the most popular one, but obviously, uh, aromatherapy can either be uh, self applied or that you go to a practitioner for it. And I mean, I, I have to say, I was quite surprised by this finding. I didn't expect to see that reflexology was going to be so popular. And again, if you look at the percentages, if we're comparing those percentages to the Thomas and Coleman paper from uh, GB in 2004, their percentage use is much lower, so between really 1 and 2 percent, whereas we're seeing between 5 and 13 percent. And that reflects the fact that there's an increasing use in CAM in general. Now, in terms of integration within the NHS, we were able to look at this in a number of ways. We were obviously able to ask them who were they getting the treatment from. So, was it an NHS provider or, or outside the NHS? How did they actually um, find their way to this uh, practitioner, to these practitioners? Did they get referred by their GP? Then did they tell their GP if they were, if they were attending? Because I think that gives you some idea of the level of integration. And then who paid for treatment? So was it at the NHS or was it the individual? So we look first at who provides the treatment. And just to explain to you this graph, this percentage of people who went to an expert practitioner for that particular modality. So if we take or for that particular cat, if I take the example of um, chiropractic, we ask them the question, did you receive your CAM therapy from a chiropractor or somebody who was an expert in providing that CAM therapy? And then we ask them if they didn't receive it from a chiropractor, who did they receive it from? And I'm going to give you an example of that for acupuncture so you can see exactly what I mean by that. <coughs> so for example, reflexology, reflexology was given for the majority by a reflexologist, whereas herbal medicine was given obviously by a range of different so it wasn't always somebody who was an expert in herbal medicine, but it might have been somebody, for example, say who was a physiotherapist who was also trained in herbal medicine. So if we look at the figures then for acupuncture, so this is giving me the data for who did people get acupuncture from in Northern Ireland. So I suppose it's not a huge surprise that 60% of people actually got it from an acupuncturist. But remember that this is, um, although there was an explanation given to um, individuals, it would be interesting maybe to explore in more detail what people understand by an acupuncturist versus, say, a Chinese medicine specialist versus, say, an a physiotherapist who might be trained in Western acupuncture versus a physiotherapist who's trained in TCM acupuncture. You know, it can become potentially quite complicated. But in this area, what we showed was 60% got from acupuncture, 1% from an osteopath, 13% from Chinese medicine specialist. So obviously, this is somebody who's using acupuncture and herbs, 3% from an ordinary doctor, so likely to be from their GP. 1% from a nurse and 16% from a physiotherapist. Now obviously I'm a physiotherapist so I was kind of interested in this particular one. I would imagine that a lot of the people getting acupuncture from physiotherapists are probably getting it within the NHS and they're probably getting it for a musculoskeletal condition where they're using acupuncture as a pain relieving modality but they're not necessarily maybe getting acupuncture in its broadest treatment for say health and wellness or for some other conditions other than musculoskeletal. Now, how did they actually um, decide to go to the acupuncture uh, practitioner? Um, this is again the data for, obviously for acupuncture, and then I'll talk to you about in general what happens. And you can see 43% of it's word of mouth. So a huge percentage of these people are going to this practitioner because somebody suggested they should go. So family, friends seem to be the most important route for referral. Uh, 7% were getting treatment from their practitioner, and 19% in this case, the GP had actually suggested or made a referral for acupuncture. But by and large, you can see people really are making a decision on their own. They're not being guided by their, uh, either their GP or, their, or other um, health professionals in terms of receiving acupuncture. And if we look at the figures here at the bottom, for all of the CAMs altogether, 
59% of people um, go to a camp with, by word of mouth. And I think it's quite interesting. I mean, anybody who's interested in advertising, the yellow pages, and whatever, that's actually very small. So anybody who's paying lots of money for the yellow pages, word of mouth obviously is better. And then, those of you who are working privately probably know this already. Now, I think this is a very interesting slide. There are two pieces of information on this. One is treatment by their GP, so this is the blue, and you can see here that that's um, less than 10% in all cases. So GPs are not, only a very small percentage of GPs are, are giving hand therapies, which is what you'd expect because obviously they're very busy and they don't have a lot of time to spend <coughs> their patients. But when you look at the levels of non-disclosure, so these are the red bars, so this is the percentage of people for each hand therapy who do not tell their GP that they're receiving it. You can see for aromatherapy, it's over 90%. Now, when you go on to the five people who use aromatherapy, often they're using it for health and wellness. So maybe that they don't think they need to tell their GP, but their GP is just not going to be interested in uh, knowing that they're getting this camp therapy. Um, but if we look then, say, at acupuncture and chiropractic, again, even with these, although the levels of disclosure are higher, um, up to 50% of people are not telling their GP that they're receiving this treatment. And I think probably what's more worrying is probably the herbal medicine. Again, particularly if people are buying stuff over the counter and they don't know whether it's going to interact with their medication and they haven't told their GP about it. Um, so obviously we really want to encourage greater levels of disclosure. In Spain, to people buy it's important that they would disclose to their GP. Um, and I think, I mean, certainly from my own experience, often people don't tell their GP because they're afraid of their reaction. We asked some questions about what people were using CAM for, and again, a lot of these questions are similar to questions that have been, have been used in previous UK surveys so that we could get some comparative data. So we asked them, did they use it for health problem? Did they use it for health and wellness? Did they use it for relaxation? Or did they use it for some leisure beauty reason? And here are the results for this. So we can see that we have results for aromatherapy, reflexology, massage, acupuncture, chiropractic, and herbal medicine. If they were using it for wellness, it's the blue bar. Leisure is the red. Uh, relaxation is the yellow. And green is health. So we can see here for aromatherapy, it's used fairly equally for all of those categories. Whereas when we start to look at reflexology and massage, although there are um, percentages of people using it for wellness, leisure, and relaxation, we're starting to see an increase in the numbers of people using it for a health reason. And certainly when we look at acupuncture, chiropractic and herbal medicine, it's very clear that the majority of people are using these kind of therapies for a health reason. And I think this is important given the fact that people are then not disclosing to their GP. So they're choosing to use CAM often to treat a health reason, but they're not telling their GP that this is happening. And this is just a list of the types of health conditions that people were using hand therapies for. So musculoskeletal conditions, stress-related conditions, mental health conditions so like, um, such as anxiety and depression, women's health, uh, so examples of that would be for fertility treatment, for menopause problems, digestive problems, and then a smaller percentage for sleep disorders. And we were interested in looking at were certain therapies used for certain conditions. And you can see here that if you look at musculoskeletal, um, much higher numbers were using uh, acupuncture and chiropractic for musculoskeletal conditions. Whereas when you look at stress-related uh, uh, disorders, uh, you see a greater, although acupuncture and chiropractic are being used, greater numbers using reflexology and massage, which again makes sense. It seems to fit with what we would know about these CAM therapies. And again, we're seeing a similar pattern for mental health problems, so more people using reflexology and math for those. Now we asked people, because obviously other, um, in other countries they have tried to find out whether people are using hand therapies because they're rejecting mental medicine. And certainly evidence from the states would suggest not that people are dissatisfied with conventional medicine, it's just that hand therapies give them something else or something extra that they don't get with conventional medicine. So it has been suggested that people use hand therapy because it gives them greater self, uh, greater feeling of control, greater sense of management or self-management, and, and that might be as important an aspect to somebody as actually improving their symptoms and quality of life. So only 22% of people have never tried traditional therapy. So this is a group of people who are actually using CAM as their first line treatment and they had never discussed the problem with their GP. 
The majority of people do actually discuss it with their GP or health professional before they seek CAM therapy. However, 37% were using CAMs because they found traditional therapy unhelpful. Now, I think often people will use CAM therapies because what the GP is going to offer them is a prescription drug and people don't necessarily want to take prescription drugs. They're going to seek something else in alternative to that. And 39% were actually using it at the same time, which is great, but the thing is they're not telling your GP they're using it at the same time, so there's this lack of disclosure. Now when you're thinking about, I suppose, any kind of therapy, um, and you read a lot about it in terms of um, certain prescription drugs, you're looking at the benefits versus the risks, and obviously the benefits in your, uh, really need to clearly outweigh the risks. And this is one of the, uh, the proposed advantages of CAM therapies, that you get all of the advantages with very few of the risks. So you don't get the same kind of side effects that you get with prescription medication. And that's often why the public are going to choose CAM therapies. So we wanted to get a handle on this. And so we asked them but how helpful they thought the therapies were. And we did this in two ways. We asked people who used the therapies how helpful they thought they were. And then we asked people who hadn't used the therapies what their perception of effectiveness was. So again, you can see percentages here on the y-axis. And um, then we have the blue is they've used the therapy, and the red is they haven't used the therapy. So if you look at the blue, these are people who use acupuncture, chiropractic, and so on, as we well <coughs> here. And um, practically everybody who's used the therapy is 90%, 90% are saying that it's definitely or probably health for their health condition. So there's very high ratings of effectiveness by the public for these CAM therapies. So once they start using them, and they're finding them very effective in helping with their health problem. When we ask people who haven't actually used the therapies before, you can see there's a difference in the level of perceived effectiveness. So if you look, say, at um, aromatherapy, which remembering aromatherapy is once very commonly used by people, but people who haven't used it before have less confidence that aromatherapy is going to help them, or they're much more confident that acupuncture and chiropractic will help. And whether that's just that there's more information in the media, um, about this, or maybe it's word of mouth that's influencing some of these results. Adverse reactions. Now, for this graph, uh, there had to be a sample of 100 people receiving the therapy for us to look at the data in more detail. And these are percentages of adverse reactions. So um, you can see here that for chiropractic, it's the highest at over 6%, and then we have all the others coming in roughly around the same, between 2 and 3%. But I think before you start worrying about all these adverse reactions, we need to look at what people are reporting as adverse reactions because some of them are what you would expect to see with therapy. So I wouldn't really classify these as an adverse reaction as such in the same way as you might get something with the drug. I mean, some of the things people would put down were financial, so having to pay for it is an adverse reaction. Um, symptoms got worse, that's very normal. And you'd often say to your patient, you might have an increase in your symptoms. But some of the others, um, probably, you know, being housebound is probably not such a, a good idea. Fainting, again, fainting can happen with acupuncture treatments. So, but with a qualified well skilled practitioner, they should be able to minimize that. Um, vomiting and abdominal pains, that was actually related to herbal medicines. Um, so I think that's, again, I've sort of highlighted already, I think some of the issues around, particularly around herbal medicine, um, and um, making sure that uh, at least people are telling their GP that they're taking them and reporting these adverse reactions. So finally, when we're nearly to the end of these slides, who pays for treatment? <clears throat> the two treatments that were more, most likely to be provided on the NHS were acupuncture and massage. Um, and certainly for acupuncture, my guess is that the majority of people providing this are physiotherapists who are using it as a pain relieving modality for musculoskeletal injuries. Um, of course, the problem at the moment is that in some plus the waiting list for acupuncture is up to a year, and the waiting list for physio is up to a year, so people aren't going to wait that long they're going to choose another route perhaps to try and get acupuncture or other kind of therapies. But for the others, we can see that if we take aromatherapy as an example, 98% of people, and this was the most popular therapy, but 98% of people are willing to pay for that themselves. So in conclusion, um, what the results show us in Northern Ireland is that there's an increasing use of CAM. And I think if we were to look at more up-to-date figures for the rest of the UK, we would probably be very likely to see a similar trend. There is a trend for people who are in full-time education, who have a higher income and have non-manual social class to use CAM more. Individual therapy use was as high as 13%, which is much higher than figures previously reported in GB, which were around 2%. 
And in terms of integration, well, there's really not a huge amount of integration going on at the moment. A lot of people are using word of mouth. They're not using their general practitioner or other health professions, professionals. And even when they use CAM, they're not disclosing to their GP, even if it is for a health reason. And 64% of people were using these therapies for a health reason. However, the good news is that there was very high effectiveness ratios and a very low ratio of adverse um, reactions with CAM therapies. And I think, uh, just to, to finish off, I think this survey is very timely because, and I know some colleagues here from Get Well UK and Department of Health, who are um, running a pilot scheme to provide certain CAM therapies through the NHS. So GPs will be able to refer people for a range of CAM therapies. And I think it would be very important that we could repeat this survey in a couple of years' time so that we can actually see what impact this pilot study has on patterns um, and the integration of CAM therapies within the NHS. Thank you very much.
uh, question about you know trying to maybe target certain people in uh, society is how do you get the information out that's um, understandable and that actually makes a difference in, in how people access and use can therapies. So, so, um, I wondered if you had a chance to look at whether there was any variation by whether or not people do lived in cities or the countryside in terms of use, like is there any issue in relation to quality around whether <coughs> um, people who live in more rural areas, for example, aren't using the, the services and that of course might be to do with distance of travel, yes, etc. Yeah. Uh, it's a very good question. We haven't actually looked at the poll that can give us any insight at all. We have, but I mean, it's something we could, we could do about. So it's probably important for people to realise that the data set is fully available online for anybody who wants to go in and look at any other issues, um, again, or query things in different ways. The data is fully available for you to use free charge or you have to contact the RT. Right. I suppose we won't qualify it, it's just that my name is Erin Sharia, I run a stress clinic and management centre, I think just around the corner actually. Um, and we would have a service level agreement with the local health trust, North and West Trust. Um, I suppose one thing that, that, that concerns me a bit is that whenever there, there is research done in terms of methodology and that, that's used, because there's another piece of research that's been launched next week mm -hmm. um, by uh, Krola Dunnenberger um, that is looking at the effectiveness of community therapy, uh, core funded groups um, through the Victims Core Fund. And um, one of the concerns that I would have is that you know we would be one of the core funded groups. Uh, we would be the only organisation that would have a service level agreement to provide the complementary therapy, and yet we weren't contacted to take part in that research. Nice. And uh, we have brought uh, just touching now a thousand clients through um, a program of a minimum six weekly treatment in complementary therapy ranging uh, reflexology, aerobotherapy, massage, therapeutic massage, etc. And um, we, we would be funded through the, the mental health budget mm -hmm. uh, and also through the, the suicide strategy of money. And uh, it's, it's just that I would like to see some research been done actually where there, you know, the, particularly in areas like North Belfast, I mean, particularly I suppose, political archive as well, but you know, one fifth of all the people killed in the conflict was killed within a square mile of here. Um, and, and yet, um, we have had an area that has you know, the highest levels of prescription medication given out. And yet, there's no sort of research that's done in the areas where these, you know, therapies are being used, which are actually having a really good effect whenever you're getting uh, psychiatrists and uh, CPNs and social workers and GPs ringing you directly. Mm -hmm for referrals. So I mean I would be very interested in, in trying to see more concentrated research been done to so actually see the benefits that it has. You know, because obviously if you if you're touching a thousand uh, clients and there's a big difference, you know, being documented, then why isn't research been done to show that positive? I think that's a very good comment. However, obviously the Life and Time survey is very careful about trying to make it generalised and all the and more other members in your team can talk to you about that in more detail. So it's giving you a, a very accurate and representative picture of the whole population, not the necessary pockets of the population. But within that, obviously, there will be parts of the, um, the area that you're talking about will have been sampled. But obviously, then you're, it, it will be generalised across the country. Um, and I think, obviously, there is a massive amount of scope based on these results for other research questions to be asked. And really, it's just trying to get to stimulate people to, to think about it. I certainly welcome um, doing more work in the area and talking to other people about their ideas for research. I think what, just to add to that, one of the important things is that, say, um, a study was done in your area or indeed any other area, one of the important things is that you have some Northern Ireland wide data to compare with. So you could say, can we use more here or less here, or the results here are more, there's more impact in terms of the. Uh, I, think it's just, I think it's just trying to prove, you know, the integration within, you know, the normal health sort of works. Yeah. And in one sense, if if you have a pilot <coughs> of research we're shown where it is being used, you know, we have also done pilots within patients of the psychiatric unit and in the modern hospital as well. And you know, if if you can show that something has been working and has been shown good effects, then it encourages other areas to do it. No, and, and if you're talking about uh, CAM being introduced even to GPs, 
I mean, there's, there's no real clear even indicators as to what therapies the GPs are paying for. I mean, certainly, I mean, we haven't received any more money in terms of, you know, ours that we're delivering. So has GPs only been referred for the group one band of, of therapies, you know, or what's that? But it's just that if, if there was some research where, there, you know, there is good effects, um, you know, good feedback, and then surely that could be rolled out right across the line. Can. Uh, I enjoyed the presentation very much. Congratulations to you and your team. Excuse me, Canada University also. Um, a lot of the research you see coming out of the health service shows that the people who are accessing the services, the people who are undertaking mainly uh, prevention, health prevention activities, tend to be female, tend to be in higher salary bands, tend to be better educated, and uh, obviously higher social economic status. I suppose the question, I think a couple of questions for you. One is, You've got 61 percent response rate, which is very good for a survey. Um, have you any idea if the, the other um, percent of percentage of people who didn't respond to you, um, if they were from um, um, lower social economic status? And the second question is, why do men are not accessing uh, these um, uh, services compared to females? Well, the first question, I'm actually not sure if Paul would have to answer that question. Um, uh, we don't have any information about people who didn't respond to the survey. What we can do is compare the um, demographic characteristics of our survey with those of other big surveys, such as the Community Social Survey and the 2001 census population. We've looked at that in terms of gender, age group. Um, and various other demographic characteristics and it seem to be fairly representative. So that's really all we can do is kind of have a check to see that um, our sample seems to be, um, be as representative as we can get it. But obviously we'd love some information on people who didn't respond, but um, we just have no way of doing that. Um, we'll come to your second question about the, the gender differences. Um, so obviously we show that females are more, more likely to use it. Um, I think females are probably more likely to seek help particularly for a health condition, then males are they're much more likely to not seek help. Um, but uh, other work that's looked at acupuncture has actually shown a, a reverse of this, that um, in a study they published in 2005, they actually found that males are more likely to seek acupuncture. So I think it's more complicated. I think that depends on the kind of therapies, what pattern you're seeing. And I think when you're looking at sort of in general like this, you would see obviously this greater trend for females. But I think if we start to unpick it, by CAM therapies and the reason for attending for CAM, we may start to see some sort of differences between the genders. If I could just add that again, in terms of male and female, the reasons for um, male response is that it was very much an instrumental thing to, um, to solve an immediate health problem, whereas females said this both that, but also for long term well being. Again, I think that would probably um, match in with other work um, to do with male's interaction with other forms of health services yeah. as well. <coughs> yes. well, on that last question, do you have any information that would correlate that gender balance with uh, the gender balance in conventional medical consultations? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very good question. It's something I was thinking about, but I don't actually know the answer. But I would imagine that, that I mean, it was what you were saying that women are likely to seek care regardless of what it is. It's, it's just a really good Slightly since I was involved in talking yes. the questions and asking you, um, one of the things that struck me when we were doing all the pilot work on this were some questions that we asked about folk remedies yes. and the extent to which people in Northern Ireland were using a such a diverse range of folk remedies. I wondered if you had, I know this is apart from mm -hmm. the particular CAM prevalence work, but I wondered if you had looked at that and had a bit of a that up. We have looked at it very briefly, and I knew somebody was going to ask me this question. <laughs> and of course, I don't have it at my fingertips, but yeah, we, we were very interested in what kind of uh, folk remedies people were using, and all kinds of weird and wonderful things that people were doing, like putting children on, under donkeys and putting potatoes over warts. So that was actually quite interesting. But when you probably look at the percentages, and as you can see, if the percentages have been very high, they would have been coming out yeah. in the results I'm presenting today. So they tend to be low level, um, and I think more sort of perhaps maybe of historical interest, really. Um, and one of the you know, things like, say, copper braces were being very commonly used, but that was probably the one that's most commonly used. So, uh, and certainly we're hoping to write it as an individual game on that. Yeah. I'm in about 12 uh, charities in Northern Ireland, and we use
use several uh, options and you know we've never been contacted or none of our families or carers or whatever has ever been had any survey or research and uh, I'm a therapist myself mm -hmm. and none of our therapy groups have even any word of this so but I think the thing is they were the interviews were done at a population level. So maybe all I would explain to you a little bit more detail, but it wasn't made by contact. Some surveys before have done it through practitioners, and you're going to get a certain bias if you just go through practitioners. This is again a population survey which actually gives you a better gauge at the population level of complementary and alternative medicines. And I think as Jillian said, it provides a database that then you can subsequently go on and ask specific questions for specific um, charities or specific areas in Northern Ireland and then you can make very nice comparisons between them. But Paul, do you want to make a comment on <coughs> Excuse me, um, some therapy this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> um, the idea behind this survey, as Suzanne as said at the start, was to just get an overall idea of how much camp therapies have been used in Northern Ireland among the general population. So it's very much um, a quantitatively based survey, so it's all about numbers, prevalence rates, percentages of people who have um, uh, undertaken particular therapies, and it's very much at the whole of Northern Ireland level. So it's very useful for some of the reasons we've talked about already, about making comparisons with other regions. Um, it's also very useful in terms of um, policy making, whatever, but if this is a specific type of research used for specific reasons. Um, to, do, to look at any topic um, probably you can also, it's important to look at other things and do other types of research, such as more qualitative research, um, looking at case studies, um, talking to individual groups or um, individual organisations, but this was very much a specific type of research looking at population wide. Um, and as I said um, earlier, obviously there's a need for the whole range of uh, types of studies um, to want to really research um, CAM use in more depth. Yeah. <coughs> what we're saying, this is the first survey of CAM use in Northern Ireland, so we haven't, haven't, have had no data before this. So I think it's just the start, and I think you're absolutely right, there is masses of research that still needs to be done. And of course, the only limiting factor with any kind of research is funding. So I'm keen to do more, but I need to get money to do it. So. I have another question. Um, was there any information got, uh, from the respondents about whether they felt these therapies should be being provided by the NHS? So we know who used it and we know whether or not they were paid, but was there any, did we ask questions to indicate whether they felt the NHS should be providing them or not? Which I think would be. That's very good. We didn't actually ask that question. So. But obviously, in <coughs> retrospect, there's probably a million more questions. In fact, our biggest problem was trying to whittle down the questions. I mean, of course, I wanted to ask 50 million things. And certainly, Sam was working very <coughs> with me at that stage. But we had to really try and move on for the final down, because otherwise, it's just going to be too long. But you know, the Department of Health funds the following. <laughs> Oh, we do have some funders in the audience. Too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I use it for further Correct, research. Helpful. <laughs> well, I think we could perhaps continue this discussion over at lunch. Just, just uh, like to, again, thank Suzanne for really good rest of the presentation. Uh, well, comments from from the uh, people in the <coughs> and just to, to make a, a few a few announcements as well. That the the next art seminar is going to be on the 14th of March. It'll be uh, Dr. Nicholas White, who's an honorary fellow of ARC. He's going to be talking about uh, tactical voting and ticket splitting, how originally defined our nationalists and unionist voters in Northern Ireland. <coughs> and we really uh, didn't uh, arrange the election to sort of coincide with our seminar, but we're happy that the system come along that way. And uh, one other thing, perhaps I mentioned before we, we break, that in your pack that you would have received as you came in the door, there is an evaluation form about the seminar, and it helps us very much to get people's reaction, helps us uh, plan our, our subsequent seminars. Again, thank you very much, Suzanne, for this.